hello, this is Real Vision, and I, my name is Rob Arnott. I'm the founding chairman of Research Affiliates. Uh, with me today is Jamil Baz, uh, who joins us from California. For our audience, Jamil Baz was born into a Christian Lebanese family in 1959, way back when Lebanon was stable and safe. He garnered three master's degrees from London School of Economics, MIT Sloan School, and Harvard, and then earned his PhD from Harvard. He started his career at the World Bank, where he traded the derivatives portfolio and advised central banks around the world on the management of foreign exchange reserves and external debt. Um, he subsequently became managing director at Lehman Brothers, chief investment strategist at Deutsche Bank, and Managing Director for Proprietary Trading at Goldman Sachs. Then moved to Mann Group, um, where he served as a Senior Managing Director, Hedge Fund Manager, and Chief Investment Strategist. He's moved with uh, Manny Roman over to PIMCO and is Managing Director in the leading quant at PIMCO. He's also, in his spare time, taught financial economics at Oxford for the last 21 years. So, Jamil, tell us something that almost no one in our industry knows about you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me, Rob, and it's good to see you. And uh, you don't realize how boring you are until you're asked a question like this. Um, <laughs> but um, maybe, you know, a couple of data points about my past and my present that uh, you know, I'd like to share, uh, first of all, about my past. As you mentioned, I was born in what's now Godforsaken Lebanon. As I finished school, what I really wanted to study was mathematics. There was only one problem, that math was taught in an unsafe area controlled by snipers. Uh, so then math was out of the question. I ended up settling for economics because econ was located in a much safer area. Mm -hmm. uh, goes to say that life trajectories can be controlled by the craziest and most unexpected factors. And whatever career I had, I owe it to some anonymous sniper. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the past. Now, on the present, maybe something amusing that I already shared with you in previous conversations, um, with, with COVID, you need some means of sustenance these days. And uh, I found it in movies. I watched lots of movies, lots of silent movies, by the way, discovered um, German Expressionism, perhaps Murnau, Lang, and Lubitsch. In general, the less color, the less words, the better. But uh, I know that you have as well found refuge in uh, lots of movie watching. I've always been a movie junkie and uh, I've had great fun exchanging lists of favorite films with you. Um, uh, let's turn attention to the economy and the markets. Um, how do you think the broad macro picture impacts quantitative investing. Uh, during this conversation, I'll frequently refer to quant and quants. That really means quantitative investing, the use of mathematics and computers to manage assets. How does that macro picture impact quant investing? Uh, well, the preamble is, of course, to agree on a macro picture. Um, and uh, I find that uh, a base case of reasonable growth and falling inflation does make sense over a horizon of a year or two. Mm -hmm. But uh, the issue that uh, keeps, uh, keeps me from sleeping at night is the massive tail risks. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, I think there are a number of reasons to worry, okay? At least three if not more. Uh, the first reason is obviously valuations. Um, whenever you look at uh, all the basic valuation metrics uh, for say the S&P 500, 
what you realize is that all those metrics, be it um, the uh, price to um, price to adjusted earnings or cyclically adjusted earnings, be it the replacement value um, to market value, uh, be it uh, the price to sales, be it market cap to GDP, whatever you look at is living in the far tails. All of those basic metrics are in the first or second percentile. And that's obviously a reason for worries. Uh, second reason uh, to think about those massive tail risks is uh, the leverage. And uh, by leverage, I mean something as trivial as total debt to GDP. Whatever country you look at, uh, with the possible exception of Germany, uh, leverage is at an absolute record today. Uh, whether you look at the United States, at most of continental Europe, at the UK, uh, whether you look at most emerging markets, total debt to GDP has never been higher. Hmm. Now, why is this important? This is important for a variety of reasons. We know that leverage uh, caused a lot of uh, financial crises uh, over the recent and the distant past. Uh, but the other reason why one should worry about leverage is that it turns out that profits and leverage are very highly correlated. So to that extent, if you think that leverage is not sustainable, um, then uh, profits are not sustainable either. And the third reason to worry is that the market is positioned uh, short volatility. Now, short volatility doesn't mean short straddles. It means something much broader than that. If you're managing risk parity, uh, risk parity funds, then you're effectively short vol. If you're buying the dip, which is a national sport in the US, you are short vol. If you're managing to value at risk in your portfolios, which is the case for 90%, of portfolio managers, then you are effectively a short vol in, the, in disguise. So it seems to me that uh, the short vol position could come back to bite us the day there is a serious event. Last but not least, I think you know there is policy confusion. Uh, right now, uh, central banks are trading off crash risk against inflation risk. And uh, it's always very complicated when you are in a stagflation situation. You don't know which objective you need to manage against. And so I think for all those reasons, we are in this specific macro situation where 60, 40 classic portfolios are not looking very appetizing. And that's a euphemism. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, in, in an environment like this, how does... Uh, quant investing position itself, well, to the extent that it's low beta and high expected returns, that's pretty much what lots of investors are looking for. Uh, in other words, what I'm saying is that value, momentum, and even carry are interesting alternatives to the 60-40. And the holy grail for so many investors is something that could replace advantageously uh, the 60-40, something with low beta yet positive expected returns um, to manage the crash risk. I mean, lots of people are into 60-40s, but they're very nervous about owning that 60-40. So I think the market is comprised of lots of nervous longs. Uh, by the way, this is a crash risk. But now we have another kind of risk that matters a lot to quants and to others, and that's inflation. Uh, you also want a market that's positive inflation beta and yet has positive expected returns. And so what we're working on is a variety of portfolios that manage against one or other of those risks or sometimes both risks. And, um, and so to that extent, I think um, 
quant investing has a place, has a solid place in a portfolio, and investors can uh, ignore quant investing at their own peril. Yeah, it bears mention that 60-40 doesn't have to mean 60% U.S. stocks, 40% U.S. bonds. When stocks are priced at uh, nearly 40 times their 10-year average earnings and bonds are priced to give you 1% to 2% yields, uh, that's not a beautiful situation for earning uh, even high single-digit returns, let alone double. Um, uh, our own work on forward-looking returns suggests that 60-40 will give you just a little bit less than inflation over the next 10 years, meaning a negative real return. But that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities elsewhere. One area that you and I have both done a fair amount of work is in bubbles. And I think it's fair to say we would agree that the aggregate global market uh, is not in dangerous bubble territory, but that lots of pockets of bubbles exist across the tech arena, across the bond arena, uh, with negative yields and so forth. Now, one of the things that I found really striking in your own work on bubbles was the observation that the forward-looking expected excess return during a bubble remains positive until it doesn't. That is to say, they have a certain element of persistence that uh, make them very tricky and very dangerous. I've always counseled against shorting bubbles because they can go a lot further and a lot longer than most people expect. Take us through your thoughts on bubbles and specifically the notion that uh, forward-looking expectational returns are good until they're not. Right. So uh, to be specific here, I'm going to take an example where uh, the expectation is zero. And, uh, and what I would like to show you is that the probability of a bubble getting bubblier needs to be uh, very high, which is very close to what you were just saying. So let's take a simple example. Let's think about uh, something akin to the S&P today, okay? So something that's more than fully valued, and then uh, let's think for the sake of uh, fun that this is a binomial world that only two results are possible. Uh, the S&P could go up by 15% or could go down by 50%. Okay, that's your typical bubble. Your typical bubble means that your downside is much bigger than your upside. So 15 in the up scenario and 50 minus 50, meaning in the down scenario. Now, um, this is not totally unrealistic. 15 has certainly happened over the last few years. After all, the S&P has behaved like a money market fund, yielding 15% with very low risk. Uh, but of course, when you get to these levels of valuation, one needs to worry about the minus 50% in this example. So if it's up 15 or down 50, the question is, what is the probability of the bubble getting bubblier? In other words, of the upstate actually happening. And if you do a simple calculation with reasonable risk premium, what you find is that the probability of the bubble getting bubblier is actually 75%. In other words, probability of something expensive getting even more expensive is actually very high. And that's precisely because of the asymmetry of the payoffs. After all, in the upside, you make less than you would lose in the downside. So to word it differently, for a bubble to be sustainable at equilibrium, it's got to be that the probability of crazy getting crazier must be high. Yeah. <laughs> what it also means in... Um, fund management space is that someone who's very intelligent and who did his fundamental work correctly, most likely is going to be wrong. In other words, the likelihood is that bright investors are more likely than not going to be fundamentally right, yet factually wrong. Mm -hmm. 
classic example of that is over the last quarter century, the um, uh, shorting of the JGB, the Japanese government bond, has long been called the widowmaker because it's so obvious that the yield should be higher and they don't go higher. So uh, it really is a fascinating uh, topic, this whole area of, of bubbles. Um, let's turn attention to quantitative investing where, where it has its biggest advantages and disadvantages. Uh, back in the early 1980s, uh, Bar Rosenberg was probably the leading quant um, in the world. And Institutional Investor Magazine interviewed him, posed the question, what advantage do quantitative investors have over the best and brightest traditional portfolio managers? He quipped about 4% a year. Um, back then it was true. Today it's not nearly as true. There are lots of very capable, very competent quants who have not been adding value of late. So the natural question is, um, where do quants still have an inherent advantage and where do they go awry? What mistakes are not atypical in the quantitative community? So I like the 4% number. And uh, maybe before I address your question, if um, that's okay with you, I'd like to tell you a story about 3%, okay? It's, um, it's uh, an article by someone called Lester Seal, who's a good friend of mine. And uh, he went through the following uh, thought experiment, okay? Let us say that you're a quantitative long-only equity manager. You're super smart, and year in, year out, you are going to make on average an alpha of 3%. That's pretty much close to your Bar Rosenberg story. So 300 base points of average alpha. The problem, of course, is that the average alpha is just what it is. It's an average. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all heard this, that statistics is the only discipline um, that tells you that if your head is in the oven and your feet in the freezer, you are doing well on average. Uh, well, the reason why I'm saying this is that around this average, there's a lot of volatility. Let us say you are that quant long only equity manager uh, managing your uh, portfolio against the S&P, against the S&P 500 bogey. And uh, your portfolio has uh, volatility 25%. The S&P has volatility 20%. The correlation is 90%. So all very reasonable numbers. Mm -hmm. The question that one may ask is how long does it take for you to outperform the index with probability 95%? In other words, how long will it take your, uh, um, your clients to realize that you're of the good type, that mm -hmm. you are effectively a positive alpha person? Remember, I'm starting with that Bar Rosenberg prior, that your alpha is 300 base points, but then there is a lot of volatility around that estimate. And the question is, how long does it take to outperform the index with high probability, with probability 95%, so that your clients can be fairly sure that, uh, that you're smart? And guess what the answer is? Uh, it's actually very easy to calculate using standard random calculus. The answer is 300 years, yes. okay? It takes 300 years to beat your index with probability 95% and the parameters that I just outlined. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm saying is that the noise to signal ratio is very high, that it may well be that Bar Rosenberg is right, but that it may take some time uh, before asserting whether he's right or wrong. And it also says that your success does not belong to you by and large particularly if you're a long-only equity manager. So 
Another way to say it is that things are not as good or as bad as they are. You, one might want to avoid chest pounding uh, when they're making money and avoid self-flagellation when they're losing money. Mm-hmm. So that's, I'm sorry if I took some time to, to discuss this because I wanted to comment on the 4% thing. Uh, but back to your question about where quants have an inherent advantage, I guess, uh, you know, uh, systematic discipline is overall a benefit, okay? Especially when you are committing ahead of time to how you behave in a crisis. Uh, we all know that um, people tend to liquidate at the worst possible time to buy at the worst possible time also. Just look at the difference between time-weighted returns and asset-weighted returns, and that uh, gives away the plot. Um, So quantitative is, as widely discussed, a way of protecting you against your demons, your behavioral demons. Um, That's that's one aspect. The other aspect is that uh, if you're trading on a complicated set of factors, and let's say you are looking at the bond portfolio, um, and you're looking at a number of factors in that portfolio, defensive factor, carry, value, momentum, leverage, distance to default. No human brain can do that. I mean, you need to rely on some good dose of mathematics in order to evaluate the prospect of that portfolio. Uh, and by the way, you know, like maybe the example that I gave you about the long only taking 300 years to to show their metal is a little bit exaggerated. It works for long only equity manager, doesn't work for a relative value quant manager, doesn't work for a bond only uh, bond only uh, manager. So. I think, you know, there are ways to resolve this uncertainty about about the signal to noise in a much uh, shorter time period when you're dealing with other market structures. But um, but the, the point um, I'm, I'm trying to make here is that, um, you know, you get much better signal about uh, about asset returns. Um, you're able to deal with complexity much more easily. But also, remember that quant trading is not just about asset prices. It's not just about figuring out asset returns better. It's also about sizing trades. Mm -hmm. It's also about breadth. Mm -hmm. It's about being able to process more trades, more instruments, about optimizing transaction costs, Etc. So it's basically doing more rather than less. Mm-hmm. After all, even a fundamentalist is doing something quantitative in her mind. And what I'm saying here is that uh, you're just doing more of it. Mm-hmm. So where do quants go awry? Uh, oh boy, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, um, I guess, you know, the, the main one is obviously the over-reliance on history, yes. the over-reliance on backtest. What has worked will work. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And um, especially in this context, uh, failing to to build appropriate risk management controls into the model. And why is that? Because when you overfit mm-hmm. the backtest, what this overfitted backtest is telling you is that you don't need risk management <laughs> because precisely you have um, taken away a lot, of, a lot of the risk just by uh, the artifact of, uh, of optimizing your historical sharp ratios. Mm-hmm. That's one thing. Uh, The other thing, of course, is that uh, with a backtest, you are always short regime shift because you are focusing 
on a specific regime. So you are short a structural change. And uh, because you are short a structural change, because everyone is looking at the same data set, you are short also consensus risk because everyone looking at the same history has built some good measure of consensus. And uh, with consensus risk, the only thing I can say is that when everyone agrees with you, you should stand ready to disagree with yourself, okay? You should be willing to pull your gun. Um, the other way in which uh, quants can go awry is sometimes um, an underappreciation of um, the likelihood of massive drawdowns. I think uh, this is something from random calculus that's interesting. Uh, conditional on a sharp of zero, an expected maximum drawdown is about one and a quarter times ball. Okay. Now, this sounds like nothing. That's over a year, over one year, by the way. Expected maximum drawdown is one and a quarter times ball. Sounds like a very innocuous number. But the reality is that lots of quant managers, particularly in uh, trend space, but also in other quant styles, are selling to their clients a volatility of 15%, one five. Mm -hmm. Now, if the volatility is 15%, and if the expected maximum drawdown is one and a quarter times that vol, I'll let you do the math, right? I mean, you're close to a 20% every year expected maximum drawdown. So in other words, every year you should expect a maximum drawdown of 20%, considering that lots of clients are gonna abandon you with a 20% loss. Mm -hmm. It means that whoever is managing a 15% vol portfolio, unless he or she is a genius, uh, conditional on a sharp of zero is gonna lose most of their clients once a year. Yeah. So what this is telling me is that uh, you should either uh, work with a target vol that's lower than 15% or promise 15% and end up uh, targeting volatility uh, an effective volatility that's maybe 10 or seven or 8%. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing of course, is that if you are doing that and yet you're relying on mere reversion, uh, the idea of mere reversion is that you should be in a position to add after you lose money. But can you really afford to add when you're close to minus 20%? So in other words, the kind of vol that you commit to is extremely important uh, when you consider the style that you are promising. In other words, if you are managing to a mere reverting portfolio, you better start with a low vol in order for you to be able to uh, add when the conditions call for that. Yeah. One of the elements that uh, I think is uh, crucial uh, and dovetails very much with what you have spoken of is customer risk aversion, that customers' perceived risk aversion is usually much greater than their true risk aversion. So they'll look at a back test and say, oh, worst drawdown ever was 20%. Uh, yeah, this is fine. And then they get the minus 20 right out of the gate. Are they going to stay the course? Very often, no. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, how many clients have said um, minus 20 is no problem, only to run for the hills uh, when it happens? And it's perfectly understandable because, after all, clients like asset managers have their own institutional constraints and sometimes a board or set of trustees is going to think otherwise. I've often said that um, investment consultants and financial advisors are doing well for their customers if they deliver zero alpha. Now, 
that sounds bizarre. How could that be a good outcome? If they present, prevent their customers from doing the wrong thing at the wrong time and merely allow them to keep the returns available to them, that's actually a win. It's, a, it's the point you made about time-weighted returns and value-weighted returns. For those in the audience who aren't familiar with it, there's a, a wonderful piece by uh, Russ Kennel um, at Morningstar called Mind the Gap. He first published it back in 2005, where he showed that the dollar-weighted returns for investment portfolios were far lower than the time-weighted returns. What does that mean? If a fund is up 20% and then down 17%, you're at zero. If the fund starts with a billion, is up 20% and now has 10 billion, and then is down 17%, the dollar-weighted return is about minus 10. And that gap, mind the gap, that gap is customer risk aversion turning out to be much greater. And the uh, all too common tendency to chase performance, all too powerful, and leading to buy high, sell low behaviors. Speaking of which, a question that I've never been asked in, in scores of finals presentations in investment management is a simple question. If you're beating the market, somebody on the other side of your trade is losing to the market. Who is that loser and why are they willing to lose? Because it's got to be ongoing if you're a long-term winner. There's always got to be somebody who's a loser on the other side of the trade. Why are they willing to lose? What are your thoughts on that? So that's a great question. Uh, you're really asking who's on the other side of the quant trade. Mm -hmm. And um, might it be, Rob, that both of them are winning. After all, uh, different actors manage to different objectives. Mm -hmm. So I'll give, you, I'll give you examples. Now, away from the standard stuff where quants could be fighting other quants, after all, uh, that legendary battle between carry and momentum has always been there and is still ongoing. Um, but I'm thinking about something else. I'll give you an example, uh, the example of fixed income, which, uh, which obviously uh, we know one or two things about here at PIMCO. Mm -hmm. um, who's on the other side of, um, of quantitative strategies? Well, you have what we would call non-economic players, or to put it more charitably, constraint players. Who are those constraint players? Think about um, who owns fixed income. Of course, you have the mutual funds, but then you have lots of active managers who are not mutual funds. Take, as an example, central banks. Central banks are the biggest active manager today. And the reason why they're buying bonds is, uh, has very little to do with optimizing a risk return trade-off. Mm -hmm. They buy bonds because they want a higher GDP, because they want wealth effects, because they want to control indirectly the equity market, because they want to flatten the term structure, uh, because they want uh, the domestic exchange rate to be undervalued. Um, you name it, but uh, one of their objectives is not to optimize the risk return trade-off. Now, because they are constrained, because these are all a very rich set of constraints, then almost by definition, a constraint in a typical micro uh, problem um, is associated with a shadow cost. There is a shadow cost of a constraint, which mm -hmm. means that that shadow cost needs to be repercussed somewhere. In other words, for every cost, there is a benefit in the market. And that's how one can explain that um, active semi-quant bond management 
tends to be successful. Yeah. It tends to be successful because in a way they are exploiting that alpha transfer from constrained players. Now, does it mean that the central bank is very unhappy with the result? Probably not. Central bank is willing to give up some return uh, in exchange for some macroeconomic um, macroeconomic objectives that um, it's trying to pursue. To a lesser extent, one can say that people on the other side of the trade are, for example, insurance companies that yes. are looking at uh, book yield as opposed to market yield. They're again a constraint. Um, pensions that can't find enough 30 year tips in order to manage their duration mismatch. Again, uh, you know, they're not necessarily working on um, maximizing expected returns so much as trying to um, figure out what is the optimal uh, risk positioning considering the liabilities of their clients. And we could go on and on. We could discuss commercial banks, et cetera. But, but the point of the matter is that uh, there's something for everyone. It's like, yeah. it's like any market, really, OK? Uh, the risk premium um, is determined at the intersection of people with a variety of different objectives. Some of them are uh, making higher returns. Some of them are focusing on risk parameters. That's a very good synopsis. So it's not so much that the party on the other side of the trade is losing, it's that they are winning on the metric that matters to them and the metric that matters to you and your clients are different metrics. If the metric is, I want to earn a respectable return on capital adjusted for statutory capital haircuts, for instance. Um, uh, and your goal is I want to maximize return subject to some measures of uh, tracking error relative to an index or something like that. Your objectives are different and both parties can turn out to be winners. That's a very interesting take on it. Yeah, exactly. And, and of course, uh, central banks are not known um, to go through the whole toolbox that your usual mutual fund manager um, uses, like, you know, think about futures basis, TBA in, in mortgage space, CDS cash basis. I mean, you know, that's not the kind of thing that um, a central bank is aiming for. Now, forgive me if I sounded a little bit Pollyannish in my answer, because of course people can get hurt. And of course, as you pointed out, uh, there are a variety of people who exit the market or, or enter the market at the worst possible time. And so from that point of view, I think there is a net transfer of alpha there uh, from people who were seeking to optimize their expected returns, but who cannot because, as mentioned before, um, they are the slaves of their behavioral demons. And so again, to go back to the first point, that is probably a very serious advantage of quant management. Yeah, I, I think the uh, question, if you're going to win, who, who are you taking your alpha from is a question that any investor should ask of any manager, whether a quant or a traditional manager. Uh, if the manager doesn't know who's funding their success, then chances are they've just been lucky. It also brings home the importance of not hiring managers on uh, the basis primarily of recent past performance, even though that's overwhelmingly the top decision metric um, for the simple reason that there can be mean reversion in performance. And the simple reason that, as you say, your 95% confidence might take 300 years to achieve, by which time most portfolio managers will have retired. Yes, exactly. And and one one more point maybe here. Uh, it all has to do with uh, that famous paper by Grossman Stiglitz about how much research goes in the market in order to converge toward um, an information efficient price. Imagine a world where only quants are trading. 
then in this case, almost by definition, you will have also zero alpha. So to the extent that you have an excess supply of quants, then obviously your alpha will vanish almost by construction, tautologically it will. Yeah, we both have the good fortune of having started in the quant business at a time when scientific method was simply not used in most of the finance community. And Bar Rosenberg's 4% quip was actually awfully close to reality, that just having the discipline that's imposed on you by using quantitative methods was worth a meaningful margin. Now, the, uh, a well-run quant strategy um, wins in part by being a better quant strategy than your competition. Yeah, you're, you're right, by the way, the, probably the two biggest uh, determinants of success are age and geography. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, back to the quant community. The quant community seems absolutely addicted to back tests, um, even to the point of using a back test to refine and adjust your strategy to maximize the back test which is the ultimate um, uh, form of data mining. Uh, anyone can do a back test and tweak it to get almost whatever alpha you want out of the back test if you're willing to tweak it enough and if your sole goal is to maximize the back test. Sadly, there's a lot of quants who pursue that, perhaps even thinking that it's gonna be real. Live results usually fall far short. Um, there's a wonderful paper that looks at ETFs. And ETFs are typically launched based on a particular historical index of a strategy. So you might, you might use a strategy based on some particular definition of momentum. You go back historically, you tweak it, you say this kind of momentum adds 3% a year, 4% a year. That paper showed that averaged across all ETFs, the back test excess return stops about six months before the ETF is launched and flatlines after that. So for the average ETF, the back test turns out to have zero predictive power. Now that's the subsequent return on the underlying index, take away fees and trading costs and it's negative. Of course. So why the shortfall and perhaps more importantly, how can we distinguish a good back test, a useful back test that may be indicative of future results from simple data mining? That's a central question. And um, we, could, we could discuss it for hours. But uh, let me start with something fundamental. You know, this old worn out idea that the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil sets off a tornado in Texas, mm -hmm. okay? Now, what's this telling you? This tells you that your life and my life and other people's lives could have happened in a trillion different ways. Mm -hmm. In other words, there is an infinity of sample paths and the life that we've experienced is just an accident. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, what you call a zero measure set in probability, okay? I mean, the likelihood of that life happening um, is, uh, is zero or close to zero. So in other words, and forgive me if this sounds crazy, but the history that you are using um, as a yardstick for your back test is in many ways insignificant. And yet you are investing effectively, sentimentally, even rationally in that history. And uh, that's mind boggling if you think about it. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is that data mining is there before you even start. Yes. I mean, let, let, let's think about something very simple. The idea of mere version. Okay. I, I like mere version uh, philosophically. And yet, um, 
if I wanted to submit myself to some dose of Chinese style self criticism, uh, you think about US equity and mere reversion. Remember that when people test mere reversion, they're testing it on the data they have. And the data you have is mostly US data, sometimes European data. It's data of survivors. So almost by definition, when things tank, uh, things are going to, um, to be positive afterwards. Because by definition, you are looking at data of countries or companies that have survived. Um, you are looking at order statistics. You are looking at the top 10 or 20 countries in terms of equity performance over the last two or three centuries. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the other countries have disappeared. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, mean reversion is embedded in that, um, in that data mining exercise, mm -hmm. precisely because you are looking at order statistics. I mean, by the way, in a 101 statistics class, this would be worse an F if you were a student, because all you're doing is taking a set of points, mm -hmm. looking at those points, taking the order statistic, in other words, the maximum number in, in, that, in that set, and then drawing inferences about the whole set. This is a no-no, of course. Um, so uh, I guess uh, this has given way to some kind of a theology, which is not entirely justified. I mean, there are reasons why one should believe in mere reversion, but this is not one of them. Um, I'll give you another idea uh, or another example here. Uh, when people look at uh, the last 10 years or the last 12 years of, uh, of this or that trade, what is the hidden component? that no one is thinking about, it's of course QE. And the fact that quantitative easing has been successful. So your relative value trades are much more correlated with rho rho than, than they really are. Um, countries that have exited the market, Russia 1910s, China 1940s, would have possibly shown mean aversion. Mm -hmm. Another example is uh, fixed income. People look at swap rates to test uh, fixed income strategies, be, be them directional or relative value. Uh, the thing is you have swap rates since the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. Now think about it. What is that period that everyone is watching and everyone is testing? It's all a period of disinflation with central banks cutting rates. What does this mean for the duration tilt, for the short volatility factor, for mm -hmm. the credit factor for that purpose? You're all looking at a database that is a single data point. It is a single monetary policy experiment. And uh, we, may, we may be about to start a new one, but that's a different question. Yeah, and it's a period in which the uh, bull markets have been utterly dominant. Uh, there have been protracted periods of time, uh, 1802 to 1868, I believe, a uh, uh, span in which stocks didn't beat bonds for a span of over 60 years. Oh, yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. And, and, and so. 20 years is a long history. <laughs> I mean, you know, there, there, is, there is a case to be made for the fact that 100 years is insignificant, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, your standard error on an expected return is volatility divided by square root of time. And, um, and if the volatility is 20%, and in this case, time is 100, then the standard error is 2%. If you want to, if you want to calculate an estimate of the equity risk premium within 95% confidence, meaning within two standard errors, then it's plus or minus 4%. Now people are fighting over the idea that the equity risk premium could be three, no, sorry, three and a half percent, no, maybe four. Actually, it's somewhere between zero and eight. 
mm-hmm. if uh, if you're looking at uh, as as long a period as 100 years. Yeah. And back to your 95%, uh, I did a, a editor's corner at the Financial Analyst Journal back in, I think, 2002, in which um, I showed that if the risk premium is 4%, that in the space of 30 years, you have 95% likelihood of stocks beating bonds. And if the risk premium is 1%, you have to wait 600 years to have your 95% likelihood. So it really is <laughs> astonishing. Exactly. And, and now I owe you more on this question because uh, the really uh, part of the question is when should you get suspicious? Mm-hmm. And um, um, clearly, there are um, there are uh, practices that should raise your antennas that should obviously uh, make you less less trusting of a backtest when backtests use a more complicated suite of factors. Um, then the question is why? Why are you doing that? Are you just trying to optimize on a historical sharp ratio? When you're relying on lots of transformation of the data, like you take some complicated exponential, or you take a decile, then you try a quintile and the tercile. Um, also, when you have high historical sharp, sharp ratios combined with high frequency trends, those tend to get crowded very quickly. And so from that point of view, obviously a statistical uh, ARB trade has a lower life expectancy. So you have solutions. Generally what we do is we take a 50% haircut for historical sharp ratios. We do something called the Bonferroni test to um, basically adjust for the data mining. We partition the data set in a variety of ways to see how robust uh, the actual sharp ratio is. Speaking of back tests, um, uh, Cam Harvey did a wonderful paper in which he showed that uh, there have been 400 factors published in the last 30 years. Just in the top three finance journals alone, three journals, 400 factors. And I asked him how many were successful uh, adding value, and he laughed and said all of them. And I asked how many were statistically significant, and he, he said almost all of them. So you, r- results don't get published unless they are uh, positive, which means that there's a selection bias problem. Uh, absolutely. And it's well known that a lot of uh, those uh, sharp ratios wear out after the publication of the article or sometimes right before. Amply documented. So which of the anomalies that folks are using, which factors do you think are structural and likely to have longevity in the decades ahead? And which do you think are historical accidents? Well, it seems obvious to me that those factors that are remunerating a systematic risk uh, have have some life in them. I am thinking about the X-series premium. Uh, People have known about it for a while and it keeps delivering. Against my own um, intuitive bias um, and my own best judgment, momentum keeps delivering. I don't like it too much because I can't explain it in any way that's intellectually satisfying and yet It works. I mean, it works for all the reasons you can imagine, Uh, committees, uh, fear of missing out, et cetera, Uh, the way mutual funds work. But that's also um, exhibiting lasting behavioral bias. Let me push back on that just ever so gently. Uh, The original standard momentum, trailing 12-month returns, excluding the most recent month, because there tends to be mean reversion on a one month basis. So trailing 12 months, excluding the latest month has a negative alpha going back to 1999. It made a little bit of money, then it crashed in, when the market turned in, in 2000, then it crashed again when it turned 2002, then it made 
it all back with a little room to spare. Then it crashed in 09. Then it made it almost all back. And <clears throat> you're still underwater on a 22 year basis. So when I see a momentum strategy that works, I, I'm a bit of a skeptic. I ask the question, has it worked on live assets or only on a back test? And has it worked in real time subsequent to the design of the momentum strategy? And a lot of strategies actually flunk that, that set of Occam's razors. I have, I have a lot of sympathy for your view. And um, I want to add that a lot of those momentum strategies have been sold mindlessly as as excellent hedging strategies as a long straddle. I think you know if you decompose mathematically uh, momentum trade, you realize that your long the long end of the vol curve and your short the short end of the vol curve. So it's by no means a long volatility trade. And anyone who was there in 1987 has never traded momentum again. Um, so so I, think, I think there's a lot of that. Now, with this said, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of strategies um, have worked for a long time and have stopped working for institutional reasons. I mean, I'm thinking about commodity carry, okay? Mm -hmm. Why did commodity carry exist? Because when commodity indices track front months futures, traders bought front months futures to replicate these indices. That creates backwardation. Now, an investor, a smart investor, would provide liquidity to those index replicators by selling the front months and buying the back months. This is commodity carry in a nutshell. Now, yeah. as indices got smarter and focused on the back months, then the ARB vanished. And um, success of backtests can be a transitory effect from the growth of in investing, of indexing, excuse me, in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Commodity value is another uh, factor which is a little bit dubious. Maybe, maybe not, because after all, you revert to the cost of producing that commodity that is uh, technology driven. Um, you can think about the ED4, the famous uh, duration, duration front trade. Uh, you're seeing a lower premium overall. You can think about leverage aversion. Uh, leverage aversion is a well-known factor whereby you're trying to exploit the biases of the long-only community. And yet, as everyone knew about the trades, then uh, people... Uh, actually exploited the trade to the point where the alpha went to zero. As you said, you know, Cam Harvey has demonstrated that most documented equity factors cannot possibly be real. Well, I think we've used uh, uh, the full hour that uh, was our target. So are there any uh, final suggestions, actionable suggestions that you have for our audience? Um, uh, what should they look for when they're looking at quantitative strategies? And uh, what are the features of a well-crafted uh, quantitative investment strategy? I think uh, it's important to hire quantitative strategies who are not just into the business of optimizing past sharp ratios, but who are willing and able to constitute um, an effective macro prior about what they're doing. Um, in a sense, there are good news regardless, because all those factors tend to exhibit low correlations uh, among each other. Um, even though carry and momentum are positively correlated, uh, value tends to be negatively correlated with carry and with momentum. Um, as they say, uh, value performs when there is reversion, carry performs when nothing happens, and momentum performs when things keep going. So in a sense, you've got a natural hedge there, yet um, you've got to hire quantitative strategists who have some kind of uh, macro vision, 
and at the same time uh, quantitative traders who are appropriately skeptical about about the whole practice of quantitative investing as it has existed um, also um, people who are willing to think long and hard about their portfolio construction, about the risk of crowding, about what kind of high frequency momentum and trades with negative liquidity beta they need to have in their portfolios in order to hedge the overall systematic risk. Well, on that note, um, thank you, Jamil. Um, uh, I think our audience can see why you're uh, one of my very favorite quant thinkers in the industry today. Thank you so much, Rob. Pleasure to see you, and thank you for inviting me. All the best. Hey there, revolutionaries. To join a community sharing insights like you just saw, head over to realvision.com. There you will get unbiased insights and exclusive access to the very best brightest and biggest names in finance. Be part of our community of lifelong learners. See you there.